Everybody. Welcome to yet another conversation with Stream at Agora Today. Today we have um, a, um, a man who probably needs no introduction. Um, a lot of you might know him from his amazing work um, more recently on um, the, the Bungie game Destiny. Um, he was part of the sort of the key group of people that uh, pushed the, uh, the animation pipeline to a whole not other level uh, to make that game possible. Um, and um and then since then he had uh, has has left to uh to build up a studio from the ground up called polyarch and uh, made probably one of the most i would say well rated and um very popular vr games um that you can play on oculus i'm not sure what other platforms it's available on i'm sure probably all of them he can let us know i know oculus because that's the one that's the platform i played it on so i don't know what else um uh, it plays on, but it um, it was it was a very surprising game, I think, because it was uh, I think a, tr a truly fresh perspective on how to make a VR game, in a very narrative sense. And uh, so, anyways, some of you might know him from that, but I bet the one place where everybody for sure knows Richard from is the um, from the uh, his 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 very popular and very radically sort of um, revolutionary workflow and we you might have seen him in a gdc talk you might have seen him at a conference um or maybe you've even gone gone and and actually learned from him at his school animation sherpa like there's many ways you might have been exposed to him and is 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 very um i i don't even know how to describe it it's the kind of thing that when you see it you're just like most animators are just like what the hell they don't even like their brain and then it starts to click as to why that's an interesting way of working and some people have like i feel like he should just make a church and start start preaching this this new way because it feels like people convert and they uh, once once they see uh, uh that workflow they they can't imagine working in any other way and i'm sure richard probably feels the same way but he's drinking his own kool-aid so let's bring him in here and have a little chat with uh the uh, the one and only richard lico Hello, Richard. Hey, now I wish I was actually drinking some Kool-Aid right now. That would, have been <laughs> that, would have been, that would have been perfect. What color would that Kool-Aid be? Oh, it's got to be the red Kool-Aid. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, I just can't I was, get through I was, walls without it. I was a little worried about it. Oh, <laughs> you, oh yeah. <laughs> So yeah, what I mean, just how about you do first start off start off with a, maybe a little correction. I assume that you guys, you know, that Polyarch made Moss to work on probably all the VR platforms. I would imagine. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah, we actually started on PSVR. Um, which oh, was, is that? Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it was about a three month exclusivity with Sony because they helped fund it. But yeah, oh, you know what? I remember now. I remember the marketing. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Totally yeah, it that. was it was cool because we had to get it working on a controller first with the light bar and track like that. Yeah. And then when we went to Oculus with the 
too because it was easier. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean, I don't know, like um, the the I, I I still feel strong. I never I never bought the actual uh, PSVR, but I know a lot of people who believe that it was Sony's sort of stake in being like let's let's embrace VR and put it bring it to like a popular platform like the PlayStation. That yeah. is probably one of the biggest reasons why VR is where it is today, just because of that that kind of le- level of mass ad- adoption into the uh, into that space. Would you feel like that's what happened, or do you feel like it was a bit more complicated than that? Yeah, I think, you know, Oculus was the first one out of the gate, right? And I think they they laid the groundwork for VR. But um, I think Sony was the one that brought it to the masses, like you said. Like, yeah. the, the user base for Sony um, was huge um, back in the early days. Oh, yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I don't want to talk numbers, but I know the Quest has been a big boon, too, recently. That's really done better. Oh, yeah. Especially the Quest, too. Yeah, and accessibility on cost um, and and quality, like they really found a really good sweet spot on uh, what you get for that kind of money. Where before, like outside of the PlayStation uh, sort of you uh, you know uh, ecosystem, you had uh, you know the Rift the Rift uh, VR, which are still amazing amazing yeah. VR systems, but they tend to be a little on the pricier side, right? So, yeah, it's all coming cool. down in price though. Like it it's is nice. Like the, the industry is really evolving quickly, and then yeah. with Sony's new new uh, thing that they announced recently, like I, I haven't yeah. seen it in person yet, but it, it yeah. sounds really incredible. Uh, it with does the rendering and all that kind of stuff. It does. I'm glad to see that it's something that's like people were saying that it was going to be a bit of a fad, and I really don't think it's a fad. I don't think it's going anywhere. Um, yeah. But uh, I mean, we'll see. We'll see how it plays out. So I mean, okay. So just for this, just for the sake of some of the viewers who might actually not know who you are, which I'd be pretty surprised. Why? Why? Maybe we can. You can give us. And I know that you probably hate when people ask you to do this, but like the condensed version of Richard Lico, like you know the the, the kind of the early beginnings to the now, like. Do you feel like that's that's a thing that you can sort of drop on us? Sure. Um, God, it, it's well, it's been twenty-one <laughs> I mean, years. I know, um, I know. That's why people usually look at me like, like, oh, geez. <laughs> like, I mean, well, like, I, let's like, why, like, why animation? Let's start there. Like, what made you feel like that was something you wanted to do with your life? Um, well, actually, it wasn't animation at first. I I uh, told my sixth grade teacher I was going to make video games for a living, which is why <laughs> I didn't want to do my homework. Oh, that's um, funny. Yeah. And uh, I'd skip French class to go play Street Fighter in the arcades and stuff. So, like, it was, you know, gaming was always my passion. And I always wanted to make games. And then when I got to college, I was an illustrator. So I illustrated a couple books that were really crappy and just, you know, something to pay the bills to get through college. And I was going to yeah. go with an illustration major. But it, you, you don't, you know, it's, it's hard to find, like, the, the, the amount of work for illustrators back in the mid to late 90s was, like, it was very competitive. And yeah. a lot of people went that route, but For sure. animation in games, <clears throat> yep, yeah, like you know, like that late, mid to late nineties, three D was just was starting. Was yeah. yeah, yeah. If you knew how to open three D Studio Max, <laughs> like you true. got hired. You it's know, so like, true. It's so very true. So I switched my career over to that, or my major over to that, in my last two years of college, and I'm just like, yeah, that's my that's my ticket in. I just want to make games, and and I can get a job with animation. So I just hit the ground with it. And, you know, you, you graduate in the nineties from college with an animation degree. And it's um, like, it was a terrible reel. Like there's, there's no one that would hire me today. <laughs> I would pay I money know. to see that reel today. Cause I bet you it's not <laughs> nearly as terrible as you're making out, but. <laughs> oh, it's pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> David, David and I keep joking around about the idea. We should get a bunch of us like, you know, old farts of the industry who've been around for a while and try to dig up our old stuff and then just compare just to see who had the worst demo reel at the beginning. Where I think I think where a bunch of us would be, you know, run, running for first prize there for sure. But I don't know. It's I'd be almost I'd scared be to look running, at my yeah. stuff too. Yeah. That's we should do it. I'll sign Dude, you up. I had this I had this cat, right? Um yeah. called Caesar. And okay. I took a clip from the movie I Claudius and okay. I had him do this big dialogue thing where he kind of runs up and hops onto this fence and he's got this sea of garbage cans and there are a bunch of cats in the garbage cans but i couldn't render them all so they just had the garbage cans <laughs> right <laughs> and he starts giving this like very british get up i've existed since the morning of the world and i shall exist until the last star falls from the night you know and he's doing this thing and then at the end the, the trash cans are like i i i i i <laughs> But it was like animated a, so poorly. Oh, it's I can I can only I dude. You, do you have it? Is it somewhere? Like I I now I really want to see it at some point. 
It's it's on the recesses of one of my backup drives. Yeah. Oh I, boy. I, mm. yeah. And it's like <laughs> thumbnail size, right? Because back oh yeah, then, for sure. So long. Yeah, it was like seven. It wouldn't even be 720. It was probably like 320 by 240 or something like yeah, that. Like was, yeah, it was. Yeah. <laughs> like a you know, postage stamp. Like, you'd have to babysit the rendering machines overnight because this is Softimage, like not oh. XSI. This is OG yeah. Softimage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which um, people think software crashes a lot now. They have oh, no man. idea. They have no idea. It's so true. <laughs> it's like we got it so easy now. It's like first world problem for sure. Like back then, it was like you're lucky it would just run in general for an hour. Yeah. let alone long enough to render off a whole sequence yeah and they had caps on the amount of keyframes you could have on yeah things in a scene yep. like stupid crap like that and renderers would crash repeatedly overnight so we'd set up the the school <clears> we had a render farm at the school and i'd set up like three machines or whatever that i yeah you know i got and i'd set them up overnight and i'd literally have to sleep in the render lab because <laughs> about every 20 minutes or so yep. they'd crash and yeah. nowadays, if you want to render something, you set it to render and it does it. It's cool. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, it detects when renders fail and it can actually go in and, and, um, and pick up on that. Like it can go and like replace those. Like it's the system's smart enough to know that there was failures and to get throw another computer at re rendering those frames potentially. Like it's, you don't need oh, to babysit yeah. them as nearly as much as you used to. <laughs> it's funny. It's bringing back memories. I, we have a similarity there that I had no idea. We were, this is why I love these chats because we, I get to know so much about people that I thought I know a few things about. Um, but I also started in illustration at college. I did not cool. start as animation. Yeah, I was at Sheridan College in Oakville, and I was doing the illustration stuff, but I was always looking over my shoulder, looking at these people in the animation uh, uh, classrooms. And I'm like, oh, that looks cool. Why am I not doing that? And so I switched over. But yeah, that's, that's, that's funny. And at the time, yes, it was really a hot industry that was growing, and illustration felt pretty competitive. It just felt like a safe route for artists to take, like commercial yeah. artists. But um but uh, it turned out that animation was definitely the winning the winning uh, lane. I kind of lucked out, lucked out on that one. I guess we both kind of. I guess luck is is a matter of perspective because it hasn't exactly been. Um, I mean, it's it's there's been a lot of opportunities, but it's also been a lot of work. So it's yeah. Uh, yeah. So okay. So so you started with this, and then and then what was your first job in games then? Um, well, like well, I graduated SCAD, and I actually did a, a small stint at CNN doing um oh broadcast design stuff yeah yeah um bumper no for like cnn broadcast things oh, like man. you know like a newscast is coming up and you see a bunch of yeah things and, exactly yeah. like motion graphics stuff yeah motion graphics yeah. crap um and it, <laughs> i call it crap because i just didn't have an interest in it i actually have yeah a lot of that's very hard work it, for sure it is it's a whole it's a whole art form in itself absolutely it, it really is and there were some amazing people there that could do that kind of stuff and i got to see what they're doing something yeah but it was also like i had to do like the 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 2000 all-star game um the graphics on the stadium whenever there was a home run and shit like oh, that so like i was like the all-purpose graphics oh, guy so funny i had no idea I've, I've seen some of your work i didn't even know that's yeah so crazy. i don't i mean i don't show any of that stuff like yeah, i yeah. do like tonight on tnn you know with the spinning logo on the side of a highway <laughs> yeah, yeah, and everything. exactly someone needed to make it and it happened to be you right yeah but yeah that that only lasted like <clears throat> 10 months um because it was it was a stepping stone for me and you know yeah you don't say that in an interview, of course, but no. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, first job in games. Just, full disclosure: you're just a stepping stone. Please hire me. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you're fresh out of college. It's, yeah, if yeah. you hire somebody fresh out of college, yeah. and you don't think that that's what they're thinking, for sure. Then there's then, something yeah. wrong with the hiring manager, right? Yeah, so. yeah. I totally agree. I totally agree. <laughs> Especially if they're coming in from like. Like with like, depending on what their experience is, what their what their demo reel looks like, it's it should be pretty obvious that they're maybe like just using this as an in as opposed to yeah. like they want to become a professional motion graphics artist, which many people do decide to do for sure, but um, certainly not everybody. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's it's tough because it's it's um it's a it's an amazing industry, but that was also a very yeah. full one too. So I could have tried yeah. to make a career out of it. Sure, but um, but yeah, no, I I got into games, you know at the end of 2000 um and it's uh deer hunter the oh Sunstar. no way you did not work on deer hunter yeah you worked on deer hunter how classic is that yeah sunstorm oh, was a weird studio i was there for two years <clears throat> and i worked on eight games in two years i was their only animator so i did all the animation the rigging the whole pipeline right and it was um five of the games shipped three of them got canned you know, in development. Mm. Um, but yeah, Deer Hunter, Bird Hunter, um, all the Duke hunters. Nukem. Uh, Duke, you worked on Duke Nukem? Yeah, I did all the animation for the Manhattan Project. How, 
how did I not know this about you? That's so crazy. Duke Nukem. Man, I, I, that was the first game I ever truly binge played. Like I would stay up all night with my buddy. We would play this game and it was just, it was, I was just, I couldn't stop playing that game. That's so oh, the OG, game. the three, the, the three yeah. corridor. Yeah. 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 yeah that, it was, it, it was big for its time. Yeah. It was, it was. And people wanted it to come back so bad. And it was like, there was always these rumors that it was going to, and, and, um, you know, some of the di people really liked the dialogue in that game. They were like borrowing for, like, I can't remember who, was it a, because it was just that line in there was like something about kicking ass and chewing bubble gum. Now that's yep. a line from, um, uh, 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 hold on, my brain is, uh, it's, I, I came here to do two things, kick ass and chew bubble gum. I'm yeah, all out of bubble gum. gum. But who, who, what's that originally from? It's not, it's, I feel like it's from, um, it's from um, They Live, right? It's a Rowdy, uh, Rowdy Roddy Piper. I think that's, I, that that's he has that line in that movie um because you can do, do you remember that movie i am taking you to trivia with me the next time I go. <laughs> i'm pretty sure that's the movie it's from but i don't know which one came first that's the one I, that's the only thing i don't know i don't know who borrowed from who that's but, incredible like no i have no idea like that's... yeah 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 that's now a, i learned that's... something about you there you go that's see crazy. yeah that i'm a weirdo movie buff that remembers random lines from movies from the 80s that's me that's, that's definitely me that's a skill it's a skill yeah, you it get can a lot be. of potato skins with that one yes absolutely absolutely <laughs> so just really quick question just because i want to make sure i fully understand this arc that you were on so you were doing the motion graphic stuff at cnn but were you in your mind already still thinking no no but like the destination here is still games like you were on a yeah. on a path okay got it yeah. So you got this job at was it what was like it was what what something soft that was doing all these these um um these hunter games along with a a, a DLC for for Duke Nukem what was the well, name it was, of the uh, yeah it was um Sunstorm and it, Sunstorm. It, the the Duke Nukem I worked on was a side scroller two D oh right okay yeah yeah yeah, yeah. okay yeah yeah I, I think I played that too way back in the day okay so you did that for a while and then. Like, it, like when, like how long down the road did it take before before you ended up working over Bungie? Well, it's, I went to Ravensoft after that. Um, okay. Because I, you know, I, I, you know, Deer Hunter wasn't really the game that I played. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I was more of a Street Fighter, Final Fantasy fan. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I had to, I mean, I learned a lot there and it was a great For experience. Sure. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Um, being the only animator was also mm. kind of rough. Mm. Um, so. Yeah. I can imagine. Uh, so um, I joined Ravensoft and ended up working on Jedi Academy and right. then um, on the very first X-Men Legends game, um, which was a lot of fun. I did a lot of cinematics. Mm -hmm. So that was my first time doing cinematics was on Jedi yeah. Academy and X-Men and found out that I'm more of a gameplay guy. Like I really like mm -hmm. gameplay. But, you know, and then it was Monolith. And that's when I moved to Washington. Um, and that was in 2004. And then Monolith was awesome. Like we worked on Condemn One and Two. I helped out a little bit with the Fear franchise, and yeah. like it was a, an amazing experience because I got to really dig in on design. Like I, I just said, cinematics can go away. I'm not going to focus on that anymore. I'm just going to really immerse myself in gameplay design. So okay. like the Condemn series, I I was the animation lead, but I also did a lot of the content. And Frank Rook was kind of my mentor who helped show me like this is how you deal with design. And like I started doing a lot of the combat mechanics and digging right. in and being a designer. Yeah. On that because that was a big passion of mine is getting in there so it was like a nice mix of like <clears throat> how character animation and combat design came together yep. and i got yep. to do all of that like myself that's, and it was that's awesome that's because it's very rare for that to actually happen which is sad because one of the biggest problems i find that studios struggle with is and teams is that there's that division there this awkward this awkward division between the engineering the design in the animation these like the golden triangle of a good a, like good gameplay mechanics and often there it's it's it, if you don't have good chemistry there it's diff which is you know it's hard because it's like you have three very different mentalities trying to do the same thing yeah. um i've often i've often mused at the idea of like wouldn't it be amazing and it's start actually starting to happen now with engines like unreal and unity that make it more accessible to content creators to be able to do some of their own thing without having to know the syntax of c plus plus is you could literally now have someone like you we could it could literally conceive of and completely execute on full feature sets inside of a inside of a game theoretically now which is yeah. unheard of back in the day and it's 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 like if you get somebody who knows animation who also is like a hardcore gamer and knows gameplay well yeah. like that's a 
powerful combo when it comes very to powerful when things feel good right yes exactly because you can because now you can use the you can rely on the inner gamer inside of you to properly validate your own work you put the animation in with the with an idea that you hope it's going to work well and play well and then you yeah. play it and you're like oh no 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 that's there's no way that's just not tight enough i need to be tighter so you go to go back where a lot of animators they struggle with that that they don't they, they don't have a good sense of that ne necessarily some do and some some really don't so yeah it's a powerful combination if you know how to co tackle both of those like both of those perspectives at the same time and incredibly valuable like finding animators that know gameplay well just yeah. like yeah that's the animator i want to hire like that's, yeah that's it's totally. hard to find and just mm. wicked valuable because like yeah. every game needs good gameplay like that's that's the core of the experience right absolutely and animation is such an integral part of design when it comes to character focused games absolutely so like, one of the main feedback um sort of loops that you're sending to the player is just the visual yeah. like what's the what's the character doing so that you understand what's happening in the game and whether you're doing it right or wrong for instance yeah yeah like yeah. condemned was interesting because mm. it was the first time we were really like riddick had done first person melee combat but it was mm. and, and it was a good start um and <laughs> like starbreeze did an amazing job with it and it was a very well received game and then yep. we started doing Condemned. We were looking at how they did it. And we we're just playing with ideas. And I remember like struggling with things like, how far do we make the hitbox on like swinging yeah. the pipe in the first person? Like, yeah. what does the depth feel like there? And how do we make yep. the hit feel impactful? And like, what are mm -hmm. the attributes that like really give you like just swinging a pipe and hitting somebody feels great. Because if you get that mm -hmm. right, then yeah. like all the different things you build on top of that, it's like totally. you're guaranteed fun, you know, like you yep. just keep doing that. And it's so hard to like, just get that swing to connect and feel right at the right distance and the right yep. impact and the right recoil and making sure your field of view has the right thing. And how do you render things over walls of swing at a wall? It's just so complicated, right? Yeah. 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 It's, it's funny. I, I often tell um, aspiring gameplay animators that this is the, something that's a, it's part of the job that you just need to start wrapping your head around. Um, and the best way of doing that is to try, try your hand at, you know, putting some things in a game engine and starting to get that loop in your brain where you could start to, sort yeah. of play what you're making and so that you can actually feel how sometimes the choices work well and sometimes they don't work very well because at the end of the day it has to like you say it has to feel good and usually the feel is like i think it needs to aesthetically look and like deliver that player fantasy but it also needs to not be awkward and a pain in the ass and frustrating to, to play it needs to feel good that's a balance between the aesthetics and the mechanics yeah, and there's there's like if you look at some of the best games in the industry, like mm. God of War, man, they nailed this. And if you look at like oh, the I people know. in charge of the animation for that and that work with designers over there, like Bruno Bruno Vasquez, I think I said his names properly. Um, Bruno is a Street Fighter aficionado, and he knows gameplay so yeah. well. And it's like you see it, like the way Kratos like hits something, like one melee connecting with an enemy just is. Mm, yeah yeah so right you know like yeah totally and that that's why that game is so good it's because totally. it's that connection like that yeah they bridge that gap you know totally and you could see evidence of this is like this concept of hit pausing right which is now becoming a bit more popular in other yeah. games this this is the kind of thing that comes from trying to make the game feel good it's this not like an aesthetic thing necessarily it's 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 you have a bunch of pioneers that are always looking to push the envelope and making the player feel more connected with the gameplay and that's a series of lots of different things and it just so happened to be that that hit pausing if you know what i'm talking about hit pausing is essentially when you're when you you say swing and hit an enemy it's usually, this is usually seen in a lot of melee based games um what you'll notice is there is a brief pause a few frames usually um, where you feel like the the the, uh, the swing stops and then continues, and just that feels like it almost gives you that because there's the there, when you when you're punching something in the real, real world, right? It's like you can't just follow through because you're, there's an actual surface there you're connecting with, and so they're trying to create that feeling of almost that there is a connection, a physical connection. It doesn't make any sense technically from an actual animation perspective because you, you wouldn't be a, a sudden pause and then a continuation of that velocity which is what this is the this is the point i'm trying to make is that you can't think like only like an animator you need to break the rules a little bit to make the game ultimately feel better even if it goes against some of your sort of sensibilities as an animator you need to be open to exploring these things because it could lead to huge breakthroughs in the quality of the game i like what you said there about having it feel right and i think yeah. that is the the crux of like what separates a gameplay yeah. animator from 
Not a film animator. Where a film animator is worried about what you're seeing. Yeah. And I think when a film animator comes over to games, <laughs> they're also worried about what what the player is seeing. And I think it's 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 a it's a bit of a red herring because mm. it's important to make what you see look good, right? But it's really about the feel. And a lot of that comes from things that you don't directly see, like that hit pause, like, like you know, like jiggle in the body in these broad actions. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, if it's not there, you, you feel it missing. And mm -hmm. when it is there, you feel it there, but you'll never see it because everything's just yep. kind of happening, right? Yeah, yeah. And like, if, if an arc is wobbly when the sword swings, you don't really <laughs> see it, but you feel it, you know, like there's yeah. just so much that, that is important to like pressing that button and validating, like giving that communication back that, that we have totally. to worry about, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's almost like on a subconscious level, there's a, the brain is actually receiving a lot more input than we're actually registering visually often. Yeah, and exactly, so yeah. <clears throat> being able to like, to take advantage of that bandwidth of like that spectrum of light that we don't consciously see um, to kind of, it's like a little carrier wave that allows you to like communicate to that, the caveman part of the brain um, when a, when a player is playing it, this is the kind of thing that we want to tap into in good gameplay mechanics, because you, you can put some of the stuff in there that players would never, ever, like you say, like, it's like they, they, they would know it's missing like they, they, they would feel like it was like, if you were to take it out, they would suddenly the game would feel very good, but they would never be able to tell you what it was that you took out. And, uh, uh, that that is the job of gameplay uh, you know gameplay departments they need to understand those the borderline psych psychological elements to the to the job so that they can you know provide the right kind of feel for the player yeah, yeah it's, I, I think it's it's really deep like the it is it does. Can, it, it's it's a gigantic rabbit hole right like yeah yeah and, and i think we're just scratching why, the surface yeah it's why like if is i've asked been asked multiple times in my career why don't why don't you ever go to film like you know film mm. you know you, you do good. I honestly don't think I do well at film because everything I know is kind of in that, that mm. gameplay feel thing. Mm -hmm. And um, I'd worry that I'd go over to film and I, <laughs> I know how deep the rabbit hole goal goes mm. for gameplay. And I yeah. know that it goes just as deep on the film side. Yeah. Just a completely different hole. But I don't know anything about that. Depth. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. You'd be like, I know people keep going down this hole, but I have no idea where they're going. <laughs> <laughs> I, I try, but I don't know yeah. if I'd be yeah, very yeah. successful. Well, I mean, this could be a pretty interesting segue to talk. I mean, we we skipped over a big part because obviously, but you know, I just used the sort of your work history to kind of just kind of kind of set, set a vector of conversation. But like you did, you did uh, just to kind of complete the arc a little bit, so we can go back and talk on some specifics. Yeah. You so you did the, the stuff at Monolith, and 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 then I think you went to Bungie. Am I right yeah, on that one? Bungie yeah, Bungie after that worked on. Halo Reach, and then yep. um, After Hours was helping out boot up. Um, I was mm -hmm. working with a, a small team where I was the only animator working on some little private project that the rest mm. of the studio didn't know about called Destiny. <laughs> and then Don't eventually we revealed it to the whole studio and yep. then got, you know, Reach shipped and we became independent. And yep. um, um, yeah, worked on Destiny 1, worked on Destiny mm -hmm. 2, and then most of the way through Destiny 2, I left to to work with the guys at Polyarch. Right. And yeah. so, that, to, let me, because I think it's, it's the reason why I wanted to get back to the Bungie thing and the stuff you did on De Destiny, because I think it connects really well with this conversation we were having about about good game feel, because the, you, you were part of uh, a group of people there that were pushing to revolutionize the way the way that you use animation in a game and the pipelines and frameworks to support that. You wanted to change a lot of it because there was, um, well, I, I'll let you tell the story, but like in a nutshell, basically what were you trying to change with this big shift in sort of paradigms? Well, animation takes a long time, right? And I think it that- It tends to, yeah. Yeah, the, I think the reason it takes a long time is because we have a thousand controls that are all manual. Mm -hmm. um, and we're trying our best to, to look at reality or to look at what we perceive reality to be and then recreate it using these tons and tons of controls, like things like mm -hmm. foot roll, foot pivot, foot lean, and a bunch <laughs> of sliders, right? Yep. And, and then when you actually go in there and you start working with it, a lot of the curves in your graph editor and a lot of those manual controls get really convoluted and complicated. And it's like, well, I see the foot doing this and how do these controls relate to that? And it's just, and that's that's the time, right? And then essentially the best animators are the most patient ones, the ones that <laughs> weed through that data. That's true. Yeah. So so it's it's um it just seemed um seemed pretty old school to me. It felt mm. like, well, I mean, really what we want to do is we just want the foot to look right. Really mm. what we want to do is we want mm. the head to move through space correctly. 
And mm. like, I'd sit there and I'd watch animators rotate different parts to move oh, yeah. the head. And I'm like, God, why are you rotating something to translate something? Yeah. Like that seems asinine to me. So mm. what I wanted to do <laughs> was um, figure out ways to make it easier where essentially just like, let's say I want to move the head. It's like, well, convert the rig into a space where you just fucking drag the head around, right? And yep. let's say you want to, you know, have the arm like wobble into place. Like previously in, in old school days, the animator would have to key from the hand back, forward, back, forward. Oh yeah, so counter animate like, all the time, for sure. Yeah, counter animate. Or just, there was a day where IK wasn't even there. Like I think the original Toy Story, I think was done, if I remember correctly, like IK was just sort of being invented around that yeah. time. And so before that, like all the animation tests they did before Toy Story, they literally try to keep feet on the ground and not without slipping by like can, like, can you imagine? Like, my brain doesn't even know how to survive that. Just the thought of that makes me want to cry. Counter animating the legs just to keep the feet while you're shifting the weight around. Oh my God, I would die. I have a theory. Okay, tell me. I need it's, to understand how people survive that. It's why they did most of their performances on the bed. Oh, the interesting. That's not a bad idea. So then when they even have medium shots, your brain was like, well, they're on a bed. So it makes sense that there was, oh yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, that, that's my guess. I don't know. Like, huh. Huh. <laughs> maybe I like it. I like it. It's it's um, a good. It's I like it. It's a very good theory. We should uh, see if we can get to the bottom of that one. But um, but yeah, it's it's um, um, making the motion, you know, the priority, and making the hierarchy the child of the motion mm -hmm. was the goal. So like, because you know, you know, people thirty years ago made decisions. <laughs> Lasseter made decisions that yeah. we were going to have the hierarchy first, and then our motion was going to. Yeah, it's just the way it was, and people just did it that way and even though it was convoluted we just that's the way it was yeah and a lot a lot of our rigging mm -hmm. solutions are ways to try and manage that data and it, yep. it gets super complex but what if mm -hmm. what if the motion lived outside the hierarchy and what if you just changed mm -hmm. the hierarchy to fit the optimal way to, to edit that motion mm -hmm. and then that's that's the way that um i pitched it because i was looking at their rigs from halo 3 and all sure. things before that and i was like god guys this is you're making your lives too hard so mm -hmm. I pitched it to Steve Theodore, who was their rigging lead at the time, and he kind of liked the ideas, but David Hunt really liked the ideas. And David Hunt was one of the riggers there, mm -hmm. and me and David just went with it and started mm -hmm. making new rigs for the team to use. And, you know, there's some pushback at first because it's different. And anytime it's different, yeah, you're yeah. out of your comfort zone. Yeah. For sure. But um, eventually the team really, really got to like it. And then mm -hmm. we built an entire studio pipeline around it, and we ended up porting it over to runtime so we can start solving some of the in-game motion where the hierarchy is more cool. fluid. Yeah. Um, and it, it became um, a process there. And then that's, I brought that to Polyarch. Right. Wow. And, and this is now, so the million dollar question that is, were you already playing around with some of these ideas beforehand or was it this like, cause I mean, cause you're now famous for having this type of workflow that you teach um, at anim anim animation Sherpa. So like, if you do want to get a good, a good um, sort of, um, brain fill of of this kind of way of working. You can always go there and, and join one of his workshops. But but like, was this something that you were already flirting with on your own while working inside of software, and it was something that you were thought you could bring into the mix uh, uh, over at Bungie, or or was it more that was the epiphany moment right there? And now, ever since that day, this is the way that you animate. Because why would you animate in any other way? No, Monolith worked this way. So like when I okay, when I, got I didn't know that. There, yeah, okay. they they were using Maya. And mm -hmm. I had been using 3D Studio Max most of my career up until joining Monolith. Yep. And I'm like, okay, cool. Where's the rig? Because I was used to biped. Yeah, sure. That's so <laughs> everybody else. Yeah. And um, you know, they're like, well, there's some joints there. Let me show you this trick with a locator where you throw a locator down, you bake it, and then you reverse it. And I'm just mm -hmm. like, you guys are, you guys are nuts. <laughs> and, Sacrilege. Like did the dark <laughs> art like, is freaking. It's a witch. Burn them. <laughs> <laughs> like, wait, you seriously don't have rigs? You just have joints yeah. and meshes, yeah. and that's it? Yeah. And like, yeah, this is the way we work. Yeah. And at first, I was slow as dirt because I'm like, God, I, how do I do this? Yeah, And then eventually, sure. you know, you get good at baking IK over joint yep. chains. You get good yep. at all the little space switching tricks. And then, God, I'm like, I'm really fast now with this. Oh, my God. Yeah. So then when I went yeah. to Bungie and they had rigs. Um, yeah. You're like, oh, no. It felt so limiting. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Because now you can only really do what the rig lets you do. And yep. you usually have to fight it to even do those things, right? So, yeah, that's interesting. 
So like, I mean, in a nutshell, I, this is my, this is going to be my version. I'm going to try to pitch your high level idea, basically what's going on um, with the workflow. But basically the, your, your workflow does not depend on a specific rig. It's it more, yeah. it depends more on a workflow and a series of scripts that allow you to sort of essentially um, process that data that you're making kind of in passes. Like you can sort of lay down something with a, like with, with a, uh, like, um, um, like the, the, the space or like the relationships between, between, um, parts of the body would like, you, you would want it, have it like, uh, uh, how, how do you say it? Like, so it, you more of a traditional setup where you have kind of like a hip controller and maybe some, like you could pose out the legs, but then you could then throw a, you know, th throw, um, throw a script at it to suddenly make it so that you can lock the legs down. And then like, in, in other words, it, it's almost like the rig itself. I'm going to call it a rig with air quotes is sort of mutates over, over, over time. And it, it, allows you to 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 do exactly what you want to be able to do in the most straightforward of ways rather than trying to make this one rig that does all the things but doesn't do any of them particularly well it's sort of like so the rig kind of like it's like you're kind of reconstructing it and deconstructing it as you work exactly that, yeah okay that's, that's so i'll exactly probably not that. exactly but I think, yeah i, I, I mean, yeah you're giving me but, you're giving me some bonus points for trying but that's kind of in a nutshell what's going on right like maybe you can do a better job explaining kind of the big the big picture for people who don't know yeah, it's all right. So when I was teaching at iAnimate with you um, way yeah. back in the day, that's how we met. Yeah, you know, people knew that. True story. Um, yeah, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, Rick Arroyo was always like would always do a class on setting up your rig ahead of time. Yeah, and so this way, you know, they understand you have to set your rig settings, so you understand <laughs> what settings you're going to need for your scene. And I'm just like, that's totally. crazy. Why would you do that? <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, I, I went along with it, and you it's know, medieval I that way. And then then I just in class, I'm like. Ah, fuck it. And you know, I just like start like, sorry, I cursed. I, no, I okay. start like converting things into different spaces and the students just like, huh? Yeah. Like, the rig doesn't do that. I'm like, oh, whatever. We're just going to layer on top of the rig. And this is what yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, Don't it's worry like, about the rig. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 rig it's inconsequential. It's just a yeah. thing you click on. So like, <laughs> so like, like students would think, okay, my options for animating animating an arm or I either put the arm in IK or I put it in FK. And I'm just like, mm. what? No, that's silly. So like, <laughs> it, it's either I rotate the chest and the arm goes with it. Yeah. Or I put the arm in IK space and I get bend and hyper. Yeah, space, exactly. Right? This arm that looks like it's nailed to thin air. Yeah. Cause it's, <clears> it's <throat> essentially IK describes not its movement through space. IK describes the bend of an elbow. Yeah, totally. So people often try and use that because they want to translate that arm through space, but then yeah. they get a bunch of like crazy elbow oh, yeah. going on moving Mess. around the space because they think that if they want to translate that hand through space, that's their option. And that's it's all they got. Yeah. It's terrible. Right. So like, I'm like, no, no, throw it in aim space. And I'm like, what does that mean? I'm like, well, you just plot a point out here where the hand is and um, you base it off the rotation of the upper arm and then you reverse it to where the upper arm aims at that point. And then you just move that point around. And now your elbow's not bending at all unless you want to bend it yeah. and you're still doing that animating that point in space like it's ik but you're no longer describing the bend of the arm you're describing the motion of the hand exactly right? and they're just like wait what wait, i can do what? that that's yeah. not an option on the rig it's yeah. not something i can predefine i'm like yeah well, yeah it doesn't need to be yeah that's so crazy and so really what you're doing is the workflow kind of frees people from the sort of the, conf the, the, the limiting confines of what, 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 what the rig is capable of doing out of the box. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And that's just like a basic example. Like that's like the one-on-one version of my course. Yeah. Like, yeah you yeah. could go into detail. Like when you have an arm that like, let's say I have the body and I want to rotate the arm like doing this, but while I'm doing it, I want the body to kind of come back and do this thing where the, you know, there's a bunch of wobble in there. Yeah. And if I try and animate FK like that, it's going to wobble like mad because I'm counter animating with the Absolutely. chest. Absolutely. Yeah. The way that the compound rotations add up, it's not going to be what you think it's going to be. That's for sure. Right. But if you put it in aim space, that point in space is in world space and it doesn't matter what the rotations of your chest are doing. Right. Yep. Nope. So it's compensating it's for you. So now yep. you're dealing with there just a couple translation curves and then you could throw physics on it so you can get natural, you know, overlap and follow through at the mm. press of a button. And it's just, it's all just so much easier. <laughs> And easy is kind of important, especially in video game productions, right? Because, I mean, it's not <clears throat> the one thing that people need to be aware of um, and people who are in the industry now already know all too well is that things change a lot. 
So you need to be able to pivot a lot. Like you could put animation in the game and then suddenly the feature changes. It might, it, you, you might have to make changes to the animation on a regular basis, but often has nothing to do with the quality of the animation. It has to do with trying to make the gameplay better. And so therefore these things are all moving targets. So you need a way of pr like processing changes and or creating new animations pretty quickly. Otherwise you're going to be exactly. pretty stressed out. Yeah. And you get, you get, you know, I've worked with a lot of animators over the years that are like, but you know, my curves, you know, the curves are, are precious. Precious curves, yeah. I've never seen a game review where the reviewer is like, man, <laughs> this game was fantastic. Did you see the curves in the yeah. curve editor? <laughs> yeah. This game gets a gets a 95, you know? Yeah, like, yeah. A plus for for good curves. You know, <laughs> it's um it's uh it's funny when you say it like that because people do it's easy to get lost in that, right? It's easy to to just be navel gazing and trying to make those animations the best thing ever. When in reality, one of the biggest things that a gameplay animator needs to learn is it needs to be good enough. Um, yeah. And good enough needs to be always seen through the perspective of the player. And so you need to get those animations in the game. You got to play them. And then you have to decide, wow, because you can easily catch yourself before you spend like another couple days polishing something that will never, ever get noticed in the game ever. Yeah. And uh, you could, you probably better off spending that time on a new animation and making it as good as it can be rather than wasting more time on something that you're just never going to get a, any kind of return on that, that investment, you know? Yeah. There's only so much tweens can do if like, yeah. if your foundation, your core posing foundation isn't, isn't there, your yeah. tweens aren't, you're not going to find it in your tweens. Totally. Yeah. Nope. Exactly. Yeah. That's so true. It's uh the, uh, the those foundational poses are your animation and the, exactly. the you can you'll be polishing a turd if those first ones aren't good like those poses that the foundation you are there's no no amount of polishing and playing around with the f curve editor that's ever going to make that not a turd you could try by all means go you know, have at it but i've never done it it's just yeah it's going to end in tears this is why i love you brent <laughs> you, you, you're preaching the good word here <laughs> the turd the word of the turd yeah avoid <laughs> avoid the turd polishing at all costs so what i find really interesting um uh, if we because we, we you and i spoke quite a bit uh back in the day because uh, i was working at a company that we wanted to kind of take a, a similar revolutionary stab at um of uh at, at working uh in, in with animation in, in in the game i'm sad to admit that we never went anywhere near as far as you were able to sort of move a mountain to to make happen over a bungee and it, it comes down to like you said like it sounds sounds risky it sounds like you know there's two there's a lot of change there and it sounds it sounds like it's dangerous well yeah there was a lot of pushback from a lot of engineers because engineers are professional risk mitigators if as far as i'm concerned and i mean engineers are amazing without engineers you wouldn't have any games but at the end, at the end of the day, it's their responsibility to make sure that it ships and that it runs properly. So, you know, so it, I, I was so impressed that you were able to evangelize this at a company as big as Bungie and get people enough people on board that saw the light and realized what you're saying. And I, I kind of feel deep down that the biggest selling thing that you that you did that really convinced people over there was the fact that you could bring some of these philosophies into the game in real time. Because I feel like you know, as much as, as much as you can revolutionize, you know, making animation easier to achieve and, and, you know, quicker turnaround to get, to get to the results that you're looking for in a DCC in digital content creation, like Maya or Max or whatever you might be using. Maybe even some, some people are using Blender now on productions, but it's it, at the end of the day that you, you're still just usually traditionally putting those, those characters in the, or the animations of the game as a bunch of rotations on a bunch of bones. Yeah. Right. And so you were right back to square one. If you want to be able to modify procedurally adjust um, in real time, those poses and those animations, because you're right back to like, okay, how am I going to possibly do that by just rotating a bunch of joints in real time? And it could be done, but there are a lot of problems with that. So what I, what I was most fascinated by was how you started building up parity on the in the runtime side of things. So you could then adjust things in very elegant ways. Um, like once the anim animations were actually even in the engine, I, I find that absolutely fascinating. But it's, it's, well, you have to be a salesman, right? Like, yeah, clearly. Um, and you have to use people's criticism of their own products yeah. to help sell solutions. Right. So like, yeah, when I got there, you know, the core leadership was like, yeah, we, we don't feel like the animation in Halo 3 is like competitive. And, mm. you know, there's some things that we want to change about that. And we're hoping that you can help us mm -hmm. see where the opportunity is. So, um, you know, we bought mocap and stuff like that because they thought that that would help. Yeah. But I said, really, the, the problem is like the human body is super complex. And when you do a really robust mocap-y looking run, that's yeah. awesome. 
But if you try and you know take this run cycle and then put and start this aiming it around, up, yeah, it's gonna because fall apart. the gun has to aim up ninety degrees because that's where the player is looking. Yep. Um, it falls apart. So I yeah. I did that in engine, showed them just like you know things doing this, <laughs> yeah. they're looking like yeah, you know, and um, uh, they're like, oh, okay, so we have to kind of dumb down the base clips so we can get all yeah. these aim poses <laughs> in there. Wrong. Yeah, and it's like, okay, yeah, well, we we don't have to dumb it down. Yeah. And then what I did was I showed, in Maya, I showed how it looked using essentially FK chains um, with a complex mocap run cycle using a static pose overlay. And right. then um, I showed it using uh, like my rig settings, like optimal rig settings to solve that exact situation. Mm. And then I, I, you know, showed the difference to core leadership and I said, if we can get these settings and if we can solve motion as the parent and hierarchy as the child inside of the engine, then we can at runtime get these same settings. So Tam, oh. um, Tam Armstrong, who was one of the main, um, he was the, one of the senior animation engineers eventually became the lead, um, was sold. And um, another guy named Eric Brown was sold and yeah. we started working on it. And well, um, you're speaking their language, right? Because programmers are often trying to find elegant um, solutions to to optimize things that are happening in runtime. And so for yeah. them, they probably don't like dealing with more data because that's that's probably the only other way of solving that problem, right? It's just throw more data at it. But then suddenly now that's just a lot more overhead for the engineers to deal with and, and more more animations to load into memory during the game and yeah. more more work for the animators. It just it ends up, it doesn't scale very well, right? But if you can do yeah. more with less, like you're saying, that's like, there you probably had their, their ears were wide open, right? As soon as you said something like that. Yeah, and we were shipping on PS3, so like, um, you know, the Xbox 360 and the PS3 dealt with memory differently, and PS3 yeah. had a, a smaller bucket because of the yep. way they partitioned the memory anyway. Um, so trying to fit on a PS3 is going to be tough. So one of the big selling points of this was, well, we could compress the animations more without them being yeah. bad looking. Because yeah. the moment you have a, a, a single pose overlay and you have a bunch of animation underneath, the more compression, the worse this crazy yeah. gets. Yeah. So like, yeah, trying to sell them on like, okay, we save compression, we can use yeah. additive layers yeah. more, we yeah. can, yeah. you know, get more robust base clips that will still hold up well. And yeah, I don't know at all. Yeah. And years later, we had a running and it worked. Yeah. It's, do you know of any other uh, companies that are, that are adopting a similar workflow? Yeah, see, I mean, these days. Yeah, because I, I would imagine, because I mean, the, the you know, I would see that, I would imagine that Destiny ended up being kind of like the test case, right? It's like, okay, sounds like a good idea, but can you ship it? Can you ship a game like that? And you guys yeah. did. You shipped two like that. So it's like, I, I would assume that at some point there'd be enough people that are believers that would then try to, they have a bit more ammunition now because thankfully having trailblazers like you uh, proving that it can be done, it's, it's a little easier to sell the next project or the next, you know, the next team on the similar idea. But well, do you know of any specific uh, games that have shipped since then, uh, since, since Destiny that, that essentially had something at least similar? Um, just to be clear, uh, Eric Brown actually had the same ideas going in, so he was a, okay. a big ally with this. So I, I right. don't want to take all the credit there. Oh um, no, I mean Tam. But... Tam was huge on this. By the way, Tam's our CEO at Paul Eric now. Yeah. Um, oh, oh, that's right. I yeah. think you told me that. That's right. But um, I was I, I was one day asking you. I think it, I was just a funny little anecdote. I was asking you if you knew of any really good animation programmers, like the best one. And he's like, "Yep, yeah, but you can't have him. He's like my partner in crime." I'm like, "Oh, damn it, damn it." Yeah. So that I so I, I would imagine there was a very big bonding experience for the group of, of people that were drinking each other's Kool-Aid and making this making this yeah. a reality. Yeah. Yeah, it's I, I know Ubisoft did it with um For Honor, I believe that was was it For Honor? It's that well, fighting game that they did. For um, Honor For Honor they were using um they were using uh, motion matching. But, yeah, but they well, also they, they also did a runtime update like uh solving things in different spaces. Okay. I uh, that was the case. It might like, be that I I don't know. But it might, it might the be sword to line up on the hit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That makes sense. That's true because uh, they would they would need to do that, especially if it was very data driven. They they would need to be able to steer that data in different directions to get better coverage. That's yeah, a good chance. I've just never seen any 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 talks on it, so you would know more than I would. I just figured because this this whole topic is so near and dear to you that you probably would have heard murmurs or someone else reaching out to let you know. Hey, by the way, uh, thanks for thanks for clearing the way forward because now we're doing something similar over here. So I mean, I'd, I I guess time will tell, but I would imagine. 
that this is definitely going to become a, a, a hopefully a more i mean we're, we're seeing different versions of this kind of idea not necessarily the workflow of making the animations but definitely <clears throat> having the ability to manipulate the data once it's in the engine in a bit more of an animator friendly way like we even see unreal now is pushing the envelope with their control rig their runtime control rig and unreal 5 promises to make big upgrades to that experience so you know this is all sort of part of the same kind of idea like i mean they, they're even promising be able to like even essentially animate inside of um unreal with uh, with the, the the quality of the, the rig they're trying, trying to build i'd love to see yeah. some of the the ideas that you have in your workflow enter that kind of conversation wouldn't that be nice well I, like, I think it's going that way like i know david hunt's working at unity now and i know he's yep. pushing for for a lot of that to be inside the unity engine and yep. i'm a big yep. fan of that yeah, I know Lena and the crew over at um, Unreal. We use Unreal. They're they're definitely pushing to mm -hmm. go that direction. I've talked to a few people at Dice that are definitely yeah. going in that direction. Uh, that's awesome. Um, but to be candid, I've been at Polyarch for I don't know four or five years now, and yeah. we don't have one there um, because you know Moss is a different type of game, and yeah, totally. The value of it is not as important. Yeah. So um, so like I've been out of the runtime rig game for a bit now. Oh man, that's crazy. The, the, one of the one of the one of the grandfathers of runtime rigs is no longer using runtime rigs. Who who you heard it here first, people? But I mean, it's not it's not it's not that you. I mean, like you said, I think you know every tool like use the best tool for the job, right? And I think that obviously that wasn't a priority for something like Moss, just because of the nature of the game, right? You didn't need that kind of level of of control and manipulation, and because you're not dealing with as many characters. I mean, one of the things about Bungie, of course, is just the the, the vast majority. Like there's a lot of different types of characters with very different proportions and that workflow really helped deal with a lot of the sort of typical retargeting problems you would have as well right yeah yeah, yeah. which makes a lot of sense yeah and uh, it, to, be, to be candid like i i i'm known as kind of a technical guy but yeah. it's more of like i'm technical out of necessity and yeah, yeah. Of opportunity and yeah. not because it's really my passion like i yeah yeah, yeah. Like, you know i'm more of the gameplay guy yeah, so but like being able to get back into that has like been awesome I mean, I, at the end of the day, though, I mean, it takes I, I really feel like it takes it takes people like you, though, that like under like that understand enough about the technical world that you could suggest because the problem with the, with the problem with the purely technical people is because they don't know enough about the animation process to understand what they what would they what they could build for us to make our lives easier. You kind of need to know, right? You kind of need to, so we, we, you know, you've, ever, you've been using a piece of software, me, it's every day. Um, you're using a software that you rely on every day and you're like, who wrote this feature? Like, did they even <laughs> use it? Like, why would they do it? Like, did they, did they even know? Like, I, I'm often thinking this in my head and it's not their fault, right? They're trying their best to try to solve problems that they themselves don't normally need to solve on their own. It's for somebody else. And so it's, it takes people like you, like, you know, I, I'm going to use the word visionary because I truly, even though you're too modest to accept this, I, I really feel like you need to be in a position to, to see enough about the technical, to be able to suggest something like this and to get, to, to get technical people on board, because if you can't sell an engineer on the idea, it's just an idea, you know? And if you, so it, you know, I don't know. I just, it, we need more Richard Licos in the industry is what I'm saying. But uh, the, it sounds like you've, saw, you've set, you've set us, up for some victory down the road, even if you right might, might not be currently um, um, benefiting from <laughs> from that particular victory path. But well, uh, thank you nice for your service. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, we touched a little bit on um, on the idea of really good game feel. And by the way, chat, don't worry, I haven't ignored you. Or I don't mean to be ignoring you. Um, we will do our typical thing. I'm going to leave some time at the end for Q and A. So keep the come keep them coming. Please do put a queue in front like Petter just did because it makes it a lot easier for me to pick it out, which is going to be even more important today because I'm flying solo. Um, and I'm out of focus. There we are. Um, so uh, we touched a little bit on game, good game feel. I'm curious your thoughts on like VR being like, like, because VR is a very interesting space. I know you're passionate about it, obviously, because your first game at Polyarch was a VR based game. But I'm just, I'm just curious to kind of touch, pick your brain a little bit on, you know, what, what are, what are the current, sort of um, uh, advantages that VR brings to the table when it comes to immersion and good game feel and like what area I know I, I was saving this for the last because I knew you probably have a lot to say about this and where do you think it's going like what do you think like I'm sure you're probably thinking hey, we're just scratching the surface but in, in okay. your fantasy world in mind like where it could go what like give us your thoughts this is like the question and like this is why i'm so excited to do what i do and this oh, is yeah, why I can everything is like 
part of my past because this is where I'm focused now. Yeah. But yeah, so like when you are like the first time I put on that headset and Quill was standing there and then she yeah. kind of she was standing there like this doing an idol and she was yeah. like this. Yeah. <laughs> my God, she's looking at me. Yeah. It was like that, then, that moment of Holy yeah, yeah, yeah. Shit, but, you're but, alive. But and not just looking at the an but not composer. yeah exactly but not just looking at the screen but like you could like in real world space do kind yeah. of something like this and she's following you you're like no no she's really looking at me yeah it was That's, it was a, a stunning moment uh, I, I can only imagine it was just like oh shit that's the feature <laughs> yeah that's vr like everyone's yeah. focused on like hand grabs climbing mountains and all the yeah. types of first person stuff no yeah it's yeah. like building a friend like yeah like a, a truly virtual friend who really like feels like sharing space with you like that's yeah. uh, I, I that was that must have been an amazing amazing moment for you that character yeah. would have come to a whole other but brought they, 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 they come to life in a whole level that you've never probably seen a character that you've animated before do like it just it would have been a new experience for sure had yeah, you played and, with with vr before that though like when no. going into so so the vr even the idea of vr even was kind of new to you when you yeah. when you joined polyarch oh wow that would yeah, have been like, well, I had done like a little tech demo at Unity one day because they okay. had me over to try to recruit me. Yeah. And it, it, it was it was fun. Um, but, you know, it was like a dinosaur walking around and it was like some spaces and it was mostly just like tech demo stuff. And it, there were yeah. no character characters that were yeah. kind of interacting with me. Yeah. And then when we did that with Quill for the first time and she literally started looking at me or then I can grab her and she reacts to my grab and I can feel her heartbeat. Oh, it's like... Man. Holy crap, her heart oh. is in my hand. That's incredible. <laughs> yeah. You can't oh, get that man. in a film. Like if nope. I was to go work for Pixar, I'd be yeah. leaving all of that behind and I'd be just focusing on some picture mounted on my wall and making yeah. sure the motion looks good there. And yeah. I'm not knocking it. Like it's, no. it's a rich, I love film. I watch Pixar totally. films. Pixar is probably the best studio I've ever seen when it comes to um, animation. But um, they're missing that that interactivity, that bonding with an actual character that is literally standing right next to you. Yeah. And yeah. then if we think out to the future, like, well, where do we go from here? Well, VR is awesome because you are immersed in this world, but what about pass through like AR where you're watching a Pixar film and then you look over to your right on the couch and there's Quill. <laughs> exactly. Watching it with you. Yeah. Oh man. Like there's, there's so many different uses for, for yeah. VR characters or AR characters are just, you know, companions in the world that like that make a lot of sense and right now we're focused on games and building quill as a companion in this world but there's just the the possibility space is unlimited and no yeah. one's going there <laughs> so i know i know i find that strange too like it's just it, i feel like the number of vr experience that I've, I've 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 actually had thinking really this is the this is the this is the this is all you thought that you could do with it like it just feels like we're barely touching what we could actually be doing with it with something like this and i i i agree with you i think that there's still a lot of focus on sort of the the, the the mechanical tactile part of vr like it's like oh like how do you solve the problem of being able to like make it feel like you can really walk around a space but not really like you, know, you ever see these 360 degree um treadmills that they've they, they, they've been yeah. developing to allow you to sort of keep walking and it's sort of like i mean th these are cool and fun and all but like it's like i feel like they're missing you know they're missing the forest for the trees like it's there's, there's a bunch of things that you could probably do right now there are much low-hanging fruit that would just blow people's minds yeah it's that it's that interactivity and i think it's it's different from film where film is all about appeal and clarity and i think vr animation is more about questions so like mm. if you have a character that clearly communicates exactly what they want that's boring because yeah. your friends don't do that your friends are kind of yeah. tricky people where you yeah. have to try yeah. and understand yeah. them and like they have complex. their own personality and their own language, right? But if yeah. you have a VR character that's kind of unclear and you're like, honey, what do you mean? What are you trying to tell me? Then now that's yeah. gameplay. Like all yeah, of yeah. a sudden you've introduced a form of yeah. gameplay that you've never had in a 2D TV screen. You don't have in a film. Like it's it's this new form of communication and interactivity. And mm -hmm. like we'll have like people that are like traditional gameplay animators or traditional film guys that come in and they, they don't see the opportunity space. And yep. I honestly think it's it's the the gaming industry and the film industry are actually holding vr back because everyone's thinking about it from that perspective so like for yeah. example like i can say you know my little girls came in here and they've got no preconceived education on what entertainment is right and they look at quill and they're like play hide and seek with her turn away and when you turn <laughs> back daddy she'll be hiding in the bushes <laughs> and i'm like that's fucking brilliant we need to do that right so i pitch it to the people at work and they're like yeah. well 
you know, how does that fit into like, and, and it's like, you know, getting stuck in that mindset of like, well, a traditional game is so-and-so and, you know, what is the value of that if it doesn't, if it's not like additive to the narrative or to the, like, and it's, it's hard to like, to sell some of these ideas. So it's like, it's, it's, it's like a slow turning ship type of thing. Yeah. We're trying to get people to think about these spaces yeah. and the opportunities and, and the value of these interactions is it's, it, it was, it, I mean, the team is great and they're very receptive, but mm. it just, you know, takes convincing sometimes. Yeah, sure. Well, cause I mean, the, the it's, it's uncharted territory, right? It's like, you're not yeah. just pitching like any old idea. You're, you're pitching something that just does, there's no precedent, you know? And so it's a little, it takes a little bit more energy and a little bit more maybe, maybe charisma and, and maybe a lot more um, tenacity to get, get, you know, some of these sort of um, ideas adopted into the, into the big picture, which makes sense, I guess. Like, I mean, like it's, I mean, it's, it's completely new and, and therefore the risky and, and people can't really necessarily immediately see the value in it until you can actually, that's the, that's the fine. That's the hardest thing about video game design in general, let alone VR is that it's like ideas, trying to pitch an idea vocally or on paper or any other way, just, it always falls flat. Like, it's not like you can, like, at least in, in movie, you can storyboard a sequence and you can make an animatic, you can add some audio to it and be like, this is what I'm talking about. And yeah. people can get a pretty good idea as to what you're selling. But a game is so interactive. So it's like, how do you, how do you possibly pitch to them that it would be like that a big, big, huge, um, you know, uh, increase in quality of the game would come from just having a good algorithm that it has Quill recognize when you're actually looking at her. And so, like, just like, a, like in, in a real conversation, if you if you kind of you ever done this before, you ever done that the sort of the stare the stare test, and you look at somebody that's like you're in a, in a big gathering. This is back in the before times, before you know when we could actually hang out in big groups before. Um, and, and you look at them because you're trying to get their attention, and you feel you get this feeling if you look at them long enough, they will look at you, and then they do, and you're like, oh my god, how did I do that? It's it's like this feeling, this energy of sharing space and getting a little digital character to have the same kind of strange perception. And imagine the first time that you actually do that, looking at a little character that's in your world and you look at them long enough and then they eventually look at you with this sort of, and they give you that sort of familiar grin and you're like, oh my God, this little character is like totally for real. Like they're legit. Yeah. Like this is, this is an idea that sounds exciting, but it's like, but it also, it, it's without being able to experience that, it might be difficult to sell some people on and sadly you got to have to build it to sell it. And then therefore that's the problem with games, right? Is that how do you, how do you convince people to build something that they might not believe in, you know, but uh, I guess, I guess VR space is just a lot of those kind of conversations on a regular basis, yeah, trying and things. It, and it can transcend the mediums that we have that we perceive them as now, like what games are now or what movies are now. Or, I think know, so. Storytelling yeah. is now like, I think, like if we look at it from the perspective of virtual companions, like I'd love to yeah. be the, the father of virtual companions. Like that, yeah. that yeah. seems really appealing to be able to For make sure. creatures that just feel like they're existing with you, living, totally. breathing, and, and like participating with you. And like, like that's that's the future of of a lot of our entertainment mediums. Like being able to just play a game with your friend, you know, that happens to be virtual. You know, like yeah. just anyway. There's a game I, I'm I'm drawing a blank. I can't remember what it's called for some reason. I always draw blanks when I when I when I when I hate like when it's very very inconvenient. Of course, that's usually the way it goes. But I'm looking. There's a game. Uh, it's a game that was I think on PlayStation. I think it came on different lots. Oh, I remember the name of the game. Have you ever played Oxen Free? No, never even heard Ox of that. Oxen Free is a is a side scroll. I don't know if anybody in chat has played this game, but it, I found it really interesting because it was a game a game that was all about the narrative and it was all about the conversations and your 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 connection with these other characters. It's, it starts in a really weird way. You're on a boat going to an island with these, I think, three other characters, and you, you there's no like tutorialization, there's no backstory, there's no exposition. You just sort of inherent inherit this this character that happens to have these friends and you slowly kind of get sucked into the narrative you're on this sort of little this little mission together and it's 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 what's what i found interesting is um what happens is there's a lot of conversation that you can interact with like this banter like all the stuff that just char characters are always talking and it's a big part of the game what i found interesting is you have choices of what how you can respond so there's like these branching moments like a lot of other games do but just not even not even choosing to answer like to even interact with a question is in itself an actual choice that you're making. And it's just the way that the, that, that narrative unfolds is really, really interesting and is super, super natural. I'd love to see something like that 
in a VR like space where it would really be, feel like you're actually negotiating socially with these other characters. Has, any, has anybody, nobody in chat, are you guys oxen free? You should check it out. It's a really, really interesting game. It's not like anything else I've ever played, but it's very, very character driven. You feel like you're developing relationships with these little digital characters. And um, I just would imagine what it could be like. Yeah, okay. So, Lucio, you've played it. So, you know what I'm talking about. But can you imagine, Lucio, like a VR version of a game like that where you're really quite, you're literally hanging out with these digital characters? I can only imagine what that would be like. I now I want to play it. Now, like, yeah, you I'm should cool. check it out. Are you sure yeah. you're not being paid? Is this not like a no, big promotion? This is not, this is not a sponsor <laughs> talk. This is absolutely not. I, though all my opinions are my own. No, I, I think that um, I think it's worth checking out. It's it's certainly not um, what you'd expect from it. It's, it's certainly not a typical game. It's a nice breath fresh breath of fresh air. I think you should um, you should take a look. And you might I, like I said. I think it goes really tidily along this idea of imagine like having this little this companion that feel I didn't I, the, the, I just I, it's funny because when you when you talk about subtle things like when you pick up Quill and feel the little heartbeat in your hand, it's like these are the kind of things that you, until you experience it, you can't possibly explain it properly. You're, no one's ever going to be like, it's, it's just like VR in general. Cause I didn't get into VR until last year when I bought my first headset. And I remember I actually, I think I asked you before I bought one, I'm like, what do you think? What should I buy? And you gave me some advice on like your, some of your favorite ones, ones to look out for. I ended up getting a quest. And then I actually ended up getting a quest Two because the quest Two came out relatively soon after that. And I couldn't handle the idea that there was all this more power packed into, I like the screen on the original quest better, obviously, because it was like an OLED, right? So it was much darker. The darks are, were, um, are a bit more dark, but I mean, and all the other features and the higher frequency of refresh rate on the on the quest two also not a sponsor it does make a pretty big difference but anyways long story short it was like people were telling me how awesome vr was but i i like it's like having it's like having a child i would put that in the same same department it's like people can tell you what it's like to be a dad they can tell you but like until you experience being a dad there's no one could ever possibly prepare you for that just like VR, it's like you need to like literally put it on and then suddenly and hopefully have a good positive first experience with a, with a good quality software because there's some you know bad stuff out there that's not really all that much fun. But but you get you, you play something like Moss and you, all of a sudden you're going to be like it's like you feels like your your consciousness your conscious level is is transcending into another level of understanding because you're experiencing content in a completely new way that you haven't experienced before. Yeah, it's mind blowing. Try um try making a trailer for your child. Like it, it's not, <laughs> it's not gonna, it's not gonna give the parenting experience that way no, either. That's <laughs> so funny. A, a trailer really for hard. your child. <laughs> it's a good one. Yeah. I don't know. It's just, I feel like it's just, it, it just changes the way you see things. And suddenly you realize, Oh my God, so many of these other things are, are possible. I got a quick other question before we go into ch uh, questions from chat. I just, I just wanted to pick your brain on this other topic of, I mean, there's making VR games, and there's making games in VR or making content in VR, which is a whole other layer to the to the to the equation because Unreal supports um, QI, sorry, VR um, sort of editor support. So you can actually like level designers could theoretically build their little sets in VR. There's like amazing software. Like uh, I, I really like Quill. I think Quill is really interesting because you know there's if you've ever seen any of those. Um, and I just this is a general question here, not just for for Richard, but the um you know these little vignettes that people have created inside of quill like these little animated little animatics and they it's something about these things like i feel like when i when i experience these things I, it feels like I'm sharing that space with the artist. I feel like yeah. it's like I'm there and it's alive in some way that is not the same it isn't it's not the same when you see it on a screen but because you feel like it's almost in that room with you that creation is so much more special in my mind i'm I'm curious like do you feel like there's a future for this as well like are we are we just scratching the surface there as well like content creation using vr as meta oh, as that yeah. might be yeah oh definitely like yeah virtual creations that you could actually walk around like yeah I think, yeah yeah i think maybe you were talking about uh goro fujita did i get the name right um anyway it's somebody just is doing amazing work in quill and just like putting mm -hmm. these really like a like a fishing scene where you have like yeah swimming up a stream and stuff like that exactly just a and little looping just, scene, yeah. but it's just a little vignette that's just there and it feels so, I, it was actually a student, an ex-student of, well, I never taught him because he was in a different class and it was around when I was leaving Dawson, but Dawson College here in Montreal, there was a guy there, a student named Nick Ladd, and he became quite famous um, on the scene of Quill and, and, and creating things in, in VR. Um, 
And it was like we it's like it was like having a celebrity student at the school because they were already very prolific out there um, online, kind of driving the you know, driving or leading the charge on a lot of these things. But there's a bunch of artists that have sort of become quite renowned for these little creations. I don't know if anyone's ever seen them, but if you get your hands on VR, definitely take a moment to like Quill is the, there's like a Quill, I think, gallery, I think that I think it comes by default on an Oculus and it allows you to like take a look at like, you know, essentially public, um, you know, um, pieces of art that people put out there for you just experience for free. It'll give you an idea as to what's possible. But I find it interesting, like even though you're, you see, so you could be experiencing this from a perspective of, of, a, of, a, of a, a viewer, but like it's a whole other level to like be someone using VR to create that in VR. It's like making VR while in VR is kind of like a, a meta that my brain um, has a hard time completely <laughs> dealing with, but it is interesting. That's for sure. Yeah, I've played with it, but I haven't done much of it myself. Yeah, yeah. Uh, time it's, is it's usually... Yeah. Time yeah. is the enemy when it comes to like, like digging into new things like this. Okay. So, um, chat, I'm going to go back and take a look here for questions for, for Richard. I'm sure that you have some, I also have some, I think from, um, let me just get that right now. Uh, just need to check the sheet here. We, uh, we take questions from, um, from social platforms like Instagram when there's somebody coming on. So people have a chance ahead of time to, uh, where are you? You're in here somewhere, I think. This doesn't look like it got updated. That's okay. I'll just I'll I'll take questions from chat. I don't want to waste too much time looking for where it is. Um, so question number one. I remember someone. Oh, there it is. I remember someone um on GDC asking you if you're ma ma making a sequel for Moss. Is Moss going to remember? Oh, I think you already let that cat out of the bag, right? Um, um yep. Miss, um, is, is Moss going to remember you moving into the sequel? Is there any development in this regard? So I think you already talked about this earlier. There is um, something happening, right? Yeah, we announced uh, Moss Book 2. Um, yeah. and we announced it a few weeks ago. And um, we've got Fresh a trailer out there. You can just go look it up. Um, and the trailer shows you that you essentially just pick up where you left off at the end of Moss mm -hmm. 1. So for all you Moss fans, you'll get a, a, you, you get to, to, to live that adventure a little bit longer. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I'm going to be taking, I'll definitely be taking a look at that when it comes out. Hey, is, Pet is Petter the only one asking questions right now? You got to be kidding me. Who else has a question? Surely, <laughs> certainly somebody has a question for Richard. Maybe they're just like, I don't even know where to start. Well, while, okay, while somebody's thinking about it, I want to give a call out to um, Perik, uh, who's in the chat. Um, oh. he's, he's doing a, a Blender um, uh, school, and oh, I've yeah. gotten a chance to look at some of his lectures. Not much, more than, I, I really need to look at more. I really haven't looked at too much yet, but He's definitely been an ally in the space switching um, process, and he's showing you how to do it in Blender, which is something oh, that's I nice. know and he knows very yeah. well. So definitely give him a, a look and go. Yeah. You know, if you're interested in this workflow, he he's your man for Blender. Pure Luke, if you're still in chat, drop a drop a link for everybody, please do. It would be awesome. Nice shout out there. I mean, what? I, I'll, that's a good question for you. Blender in general, like I mean, I it's on my list of things to really dig into. I haven't had a lot of time lately to do it, but it's something that I desperately want to, cause I really feel like there's, there's some, ser I see a trend forming right now, which is interesting. So yeah. like, are you feeling the same thing? I don't know. Like, yeah, like, uh, I'm, I'm being prompted a lot <laughs> by, yeah. by people who imagine. love it to, to get into it. And we're getting, mm -hmm. you know, whenever we hire, we get a lot of candidates at no blender, um, because it's free and anyone in yeah. school can just jump in and start using That's it. Exactly. Um, but like for us to be able to move over to it for a studio, it would yeah. be like, well, there needs to be a clear advantage to for redoing sure. our pipeline and all that kind of stuff. And, yeah. Um, from a feature standpoint, Maya still kind of has more yeah. things for us. Yeah. Um, and the downside being Maya mm. costs money. But when you're talking about the production of a game that costs millions of dollars, it's a drop in the bucket, right? So for like, sure. Yeah. Well, and also, like I say, like you said, there's a certain amount of inertia that forms at a, at a studio with regards to tooling and pipeline is yeah. like, I mean, I remember I lived through it as you did, I'm sure as well. But back when, um, back in the golden era, where where these software companies were all owned by different companies, um, I remember that the um, um, uh, man, I lost my train of thought. It was the the uh, the fact that uh i can't remember what we were talking about we were talking about how blender is free and it's uh in the pipelines yes okay now i remember so the the thing was that 
the the um everyone was using soft homage like soft homage in film at least and 3d max was in games there were those were the titans there was like no contest maya came on the scene and they were owned by um alias wavefront in toronto yeah. and uh there was houdini they were also uh side effect software in toronto and of course um there they were both trying to find a way of getting some 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 share in this in the in in the number of people that were using their software but Maya, I mean, Soft Homage really had a good stranglehold on VFX and on long format film, uh, feature feature films and animated stuff. But what happened, interestingly, was that um, Soft Homage ended up kind of, um, they got, at one point, they got bought by Microsoft. Fun fact. They, and Microsoft told them that, look, this is what you're going to do. You're going to port Soft Homage to Windows. And this was when back when Soft Image and Maya and 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 Houdini were all the they're all the ones that lived in the VFX like the feature film side of things. Yeah. Where again, Soft Image, I mean, um, Three Stone Max was alone with no real competition in games. They were just like yeah. that was it. But but back then, and they were obviously on PC because that was that was like the first version of of of, of uh, 3D Studio was running on like probably DOS back in the day. Um, but so. This interesting move by Microsoft forced the actual the, the porting to Windows NT back then, and uh, which was like the yeah it was like the 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 kind of the professional Windows as yeah. opposed to it being like the home version of Windows. Now there's only just one, and you can kind of upgrade for more more sort of tools inside of Windows. But the um, the interesting thing was that because they were so distracted doing that, it gave Maya a big leg up, and people were like for, they fought it for a long time, like years where you had a lot of like animators and a lot of artists that wanted to switch over to Maya because it was fresher, it was newer, it was faster, it would, had more tricks up its sleeve, but there was a resistance and it lasted for a long time. And then it was sad because people finally started shifting to Maya and then Soft Image finally came out with XSI, which in my opinion was still the better one out of all of them. It, it was amazing. And it was too late. Because the people once that once the decision was made and money was spent, no one's going to go. Oh wait, hold the press. Let's go back. Okay, Soft Image finally came up with a new one, and it's it unfortunately was the was the end of Soft Image because I mean they eventually got bought by Autodesk and Autodesk kind of shut it down. But uh, I don't know if anyone's it's shout out to anybody who's actually used XSI because it was it was awesome. Yeah, I uh, Jedi Academy was made in XSI. Oh really? I didn't know that. Interesting. So you had a, so and I I think it probably would have been um in your mind probably worked really well with the way your brain thinks because it had a very non-destructive workflow to it. It was very, it was known for being very procedural and very layered to what you could actually do rather than like a lot of, a lot of workflows when it comes to rigs and stuff are very like, there's a lot of points of no return. I'm not to say, not, I'm not trying to say XSI had no points of no return, but they had fewer of them. They were trying to make a software that was a little bit more um, blended than, um, you know, sectioned yeah, I, off into like phases. I wish I would have gotten into it more. Like mm. it was one of those things where I was, it was my first triple A game. So I wasn't too into the technical at that point. I was handed a mm. rig and I used it type of thing. But right. what I, what I do mm. remember of it, it was very good at modeling. Like we modeled yeah, a yeah. lot of the, the player characters. Actually animators did a lot of modeling back then. Mm. <laughs> so I'm <laughs> you sure you that. remember that. Oh, I do. It feels weird to think that that was the, like, it was like we were 3d artists. We weren't like animators yeah. and we had to do all the things you know, doing like, I mean, especially VFX, if you worked at a small VFX company, you were often in charge of doing all the things, like even the, even the compositing, like you were in, you ended up doing like a shot in a film, uh, modeling, 3D tracking, animating, like the whole gamut, even, even often, even the rendering, even though that was often, you know, someone else, because that was a whole other layer that they couldn't expect everyone to know how to do, but. Yeah, it's weird. That's like the 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 good old days of the Wild West, the gold rush of 3D, back in the uh, the early 2000s. It's crazy to think of that. Um, let me see. I got maybe a couple more questions here that might have popped up. Let me see. Let me see. Um, oh, by the way, did someone? Uh, the, it was Pure Luke, right? Was that the person that was in chat? Because I haven't Pure seen a link yet. Do you have a? Do, uh, I think somebody posted it. It's like oh, they did. P two design. P two design gumroad.com, I believe. That's the I one. Click on. I'm gonna look. I'm gonna click on it and see. What yeah, I'm yeah. Doing. What could possibly go wrong? I don't know. Random, random link. It's not working. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. Oh. Well. Um. But yeah, uh, yeah. His class is is. I, I mean, I, I'm still going through it, so I I haven't seen it all yet. But what I've seen is. Oh yeah, that's him. Yeah, that is him. Okay. Yeah, 
Okay, so that one right here, this one right here, that's the link that the the P2 design Gum Road. Yep. Okay, cool. There you go. So if you want to check that out, if you're interested, because I know a lot of the people in chat are interested in Blender. Some of them are actively using it. A lot of it has to do with just accessibility. It's free, which makes, you know, Autodesk doesn't exactly make it easy for people to just pick up and learn these days, sadly. Um, where, yeah, it's a huge mistake. I, like, I mean, I just don't know, like, who, like, who made that call? It's sad, man. Like, it's like, you want to be, like, part of it's like, it's, 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 you know, it would be an unheard of move back in the day when they were all owned by different companies because the companies knew that the the future of their their the profits was essentially how many people knew how to use their software it was like that was the like kind of you could you could fight that battle kind of in the future in a way by 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 making sure people had access to it you know talk to schools make sure that they had accessibility to training and um, and now it's sort of like they're making it more difficult and I just don't know why they would do that. Maybe yeah. because they don't, they don't have, they have no competitors, I guess, other than Blender. Oh, Blender. They have no idea how competitive it's about to get, though. Yeah, that's Blender's, it, ex Blender's exactly. on the rise. But, but the real threat is um, Unreal and Unity. Yes, I agree. They're, they're, they're I agree. creating yeah. animation authoring tools oh, yeah. in their engines. Oh, yeah. Why go to a third-party app if you can do your entire pipeline I'm, inside the engine? I and agree. It's rudimentary right now, but that doesn't mean three long. years from now it'll still be. No, just take a look at what all you have to do is look at the track record that Unreal has had over the last last several years. Look at some of the acquisitions they've been making. Yeah. They're preparing to like take over everything, and with their considering their their virtual production pipeline that that services the pretty much the the future of filmmaking especially VFX heavy bait, like the Mandalorian, like their whole production pivoted around using Unreal in their production and their, their sort of virtual, their virtual production pipeline. And it's, it's, it's not, it's like, it's, it's here to stay and they're going to keep building on it. And you're right. The most logical thing for them to do is to double down and make it more convenient for you to just not even have to use more than one software, just have it all there and all in one, one, one tidy little, uh, package so you don't have to sort of you know the, the, the concept of exporting becomes like a, a thing of the past which is annoying i think i like how i like how unity handles this because at least unity can just read in natively the fbx's which i think is really cool keep losing focus um where where unreal you still need to create like unreal assets out of those which is you know and they make it still pretty easy like they but it's not the same as just like literally going and updating the fbx and suddenly it's it's updated in the game which is kind of nice um, so imagine not even have to go outside of the software to do that. And you just like literally make the changes in the software and there is literally no export button or import button anymore. It's just there. We're not crazy. far. We're not far from that. I agree. And I think that you, when you see that the kind of energy they're putting into both of the, those engines into the rigging tools and the animation tools, it's been a big hot topic lately. So that's clearly where they're headed. There's no doubt in my mind. I agree. Yeah, Unreal Engine 5. I'm really curious. Yeah. I got my eye on that. I think it's going to be, they're going to have some pretty big surprises animation wise in there. I think hopefully so. a working sequencer would be a good one. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Little dig in there. Ooh, <laughs> shots fired. The of my existence. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, yeah, it, it can, I agree. It's, it, it has a tendency of not doing all the things the way it, you would hope it would do, but yeah. I mean, it's Under still pretty good. Amazing. But the sequencer has been tough. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, okay. I think Petter, you had another question here. I don't know why you guys are being so quiet today. Pixel Brent. What are you saying? Pixel Sunny. I don't know what pixel means. Someone shouted out pixel Brent and I don't know what that oh, means. Because you were going out of focus and it went all pixely. Oh God, God, man, you're sharper than I am. I for, completely forgot. I'm like a squirrel. I just forgot. No, no, that, for sure. That's what it was. I just became like a garble of, yeah, exactly. Gar Cam, that? Man, you're good. You're either a mind I reader you were or trying just... to, to do like a destiny force cast on me. Yeah, I was. I was trying to I was trying to take over. Oh, I, it damn, was there, it Jesus. worked, it worked. It totally what the hell? Worked. I'm sorry, man. I just don't know all my power sometimes. It's just because this the autofocus it gets a little weird on this camera. Because it's not a it's not a web camera, it's a it's an actual camera camera. Um let's see here. We had I think we had another question from Petar. He's the only one asking questions today. I usually have questions coming out of out of everywhere. Um, at what point should an animator get exposed to your your way of working? I'm a beginner animator who's thinking of signing up, but I'm not sure if it's advanced for me or if it's just a different workflow. That's a very good question. It is a very good question. Um, so Animation Sherpa, um, I'm sure that's what he's talking about. Um, uh, I think so, yeah. Uh, it's It does assume there's a base level of Maya because it's all done through Maya. Um, it does assume base level in Maya, and it does assume that you know you know how to set keys and you know like general animation principles. 
Um, you don't need to know how to rig. You don't need to know, um, like you don't need to be an expert of animation to be able to take advantage of the course. And the course does a really good job at, of like in the first 10 or 11 lectures of going through very basic stuff. Like mm. here's how you create a locator and here's how you use it to control something in your scene and reverse the constraints and stuff like that. And then, you know, by the time you're on lecture 33, 34, it's just like, you know, crazy shit, like mad scientist stuff going on where I'm automating so much of the motion. Um, and, you know, like that's, it's the type of thing where, you know, if you were to sign up and you know basics in Maya and you know how to get around, you know how to animate in Maya, it's it's good for you. Like it'll it'll be useful. But if, if depending on the beginner level, like um, you might want to wait a year or so, you get a little bit more experience into your belt. I don't know, it's hard to say. The school's not going anywhere. We're sticking around. I'm hopefully going to do more courses in the future. But um, And then over the course of your career, you can always come back to those videos and take a look at the more advanced ones. Yeah. And then as you get better at practicing the first 10 to 15 videos and you, they become like a normal part of your work process, then the other like 15 or so videos will be even more useful for you on down the road. Um, and then like you come back and watch them again, watch them again, let it all sink in. Cause it, I think the, the, the challenge for the school that I have is that, you know, I, I think I, I, I do a good job of it explaining how to do something, but I don't, I don't do a good job at showing when to do it. And I think that that is my next step for the school of trying to show more practical examples on how to leverage a lot of these workflows. And I think that just takes more time, but I've been crunching my ass off on Moss too. So I haven't, I haven't been able to do that, but I'm hoping after Moss 2 is done, I can jump back in. Yeah. I think that's really good. I think that's good advice um, that Richard just gave you. I, 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 I think you should, you personally, I think it's the kind of thing that the earlier, the better, because it's going to give you, because all the other material you're going to find out there is going to be doing it the traditional way. I think it's interesting to be able to see that traditional way through the lens of seeing that there is another way of thinking about these things. Uh, it may be a little overwhelming for some because then you're like, okay, but which way should I go? But I think it just, I feel like having that knowledge at the onset of your journey could be very advantageous because you can always start weighing the pluses and minuses between the two different ways of approaching. Cause at the end of the day, these are just tools in your bag of tricks, right? Like as long as you have a way of getting the job done in an efficient way, then that's the way you pick. And you might not always pick the Richard Lico approach, quote unquote. Um, and I, you know, I know that Richard's already said a couple of times, it's not his approach. There's, I think a lot of people that have contributed to this. I yeah, think Richard, yeah. you, you probably made it somewhat famous um, just because of some of the talks you've done on it. You've been, you've, You've, uh, you've you've kind of brought it to mo a lot of people's attention. That's what, why you always get affiliated with it. But I think that um, it's just it's a, a way of doing it. And um, sometimes it might be the perfect way to solve the problem. And sometimes maybe not. I think you, animation should always strive to have um, a, a bigger understanding of different approaches to solving these problems because you want to pick the one that makes the most sense, most amount of sense for you personally and also for the actual job at hand. Yeah, yeah, that's a very well put. Um, and just, honestly, like it, what I'll do is, you know, since we're doing this talk here, I might as well, I'll just throw up a, a, a coupon on my Twitter account after that we're done here. Oh, you're nice. That's super cool. Um, so this way, if you're interested in joining, you get yeah. a, I'll do a hundred dollar off. This nice. That's so cool. Um, it's very generous of you. Um, on your Twitter, what is your Twitter? Yeah. Just so people can find you at Fufinu. F O O F I N U. Ooh, that's, that's yeah. Okay. I remember you use it as your handle. Fufinu. Yeah, Say it again. F. What is it again? F, F what? O O F I N U. Like this. Right? At Fufanu. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, okay. There you go. Now you know. So pay attention to that. Uh, it'll be hot off the press. I, I honestly, the, the course is amazing and it's, it's exactly what, what you would need if you really wanted to get a deep dive into this sort of philosophy. I think it's going to really change the way you see things in many ways. And that's a good thing because it gives you perspective and perspective is everything when you're trying to solve uh, complicated problems and animations are often complicated problems, especially in the context of a video game. So uh, definitely, definitely give it, give it a little look. Um, I got one last question, and then I'm going to wrap things up so I don't take any more of your time because I know you're a very busy person. Are you okay for one more question? Yeah, sure. Okay. All right, here it is. Um, any recommendations to get in touch with VR after having seen only the bad experiences from automotive companies, something that that uh, that will blow my mind? Uh, I'm, I'm curious what you mean by bad experiences with automotive companies. I don't know what you mean by that. Yeah. <laughs> Christine's watching her. I, I see your I see your message, Christine. 
I know Tesla does a virtual like um, car shopping experience in VR, um, which seemed interesting to me to be able to just like color your car however you want it and look at it from from 360. But yeah, yeah. it's boring. Um, and it's yeah, not, I mean, it's I I would. Thing. I, he's not Richard's not going to do it because he's not the kind of guy to do it. But I, go, go play Moss. It's going to blow your mind. I swear <laughs> to God, it's going to blow your mind. I'm telling you, it's not what you're going to expect. It's not like it's 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 not trying to just be like the 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 sparkly version of VR and just it. it instead, it's like be, having taking a very interesting. Like it was clear that you all as a team asked yourselves, how can we use VR in a way that's that's that separates us from from all the other things that are going on out there like it's like how can we do it in a very meaningful um way that sort of that will surprise people and i i i and i i definitely feel like you achieved that goal so i think that if you if you're new to vr you should absolutely try it because it's it's going to blow your mind on a level you gotta you gotta wait for it though because it builds on you that's the thing it's 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 not like you're going to put the headset on and play vr and right away you're gonna be like oh my god it's going to be you're going to realize over time that you feel like there's there's an experience you're sharing with this little character that um, you don't get in, in in any other game that I've ever played at least. Yeah, so you, you know, should definitely try it. A good showcase for VR is um, Valve's Half Life game. Oh yeah! Oh my god! Totally. So good. And yeah. and it's like Moss is a you know Moss was made by 15 people and that include mm. you know our business team too right so it was actually yeah. like 11 developers so and it was made over a year and a half so it ain't a big game because that many people can't make a big game in a year and a half. Um, but Half-Life is, is a pretty big game. It's a pretty substantial experience. And it's, it's, it's got some really great moments. Like you feel real sense of dread, like you feel a good sense of wonder, yep. The, yep. the interactivity, the, the feeling of grabbing something and throwing it. Do you know how hard it is to throw an object in VR and make it I feel know. right? I know. I do know actually. <laughs> and, I, and I'm terrible at it, but yes, it's, it's not they, so easy. They do it like they, I know. they figured it out. They got it I feeling know. good and like, yeah, yeah, I can't recommend that enough. And you know, little things about that game, like the, how good it feels to pick objects up because they have that sort of like, and they did, they, they wrote it into the fiction, right? Like you have this glove that you get and yeah. it can sort of like gravitationally pull. I mean, Valve Half-Life games are always have a cool gadgets in it, like the grav gun in in, in the original Half-Life series. But this Half-Life Alex game is for sure, it's, it's I, I would say that it's a mandatory gameplay experience when it comes to VR because I feel like they threw money at it and they leveraged as much as they could out of VR and it's probably one of the most polished experiences you're going to actually end up seeing in a traditional sense and it really involves you like some of the things that they have in that game like there's that moment not not to spoil anything but there's a moment where you're having a conversation with a guy up in the window and he's like oh hey take this gun and he throws the gun and you try to catch it but you don't you can if you manage to catch it it's great but if you don't then he's like oh man it's, it's over there behind the car and then you're like looking for the stupid gun like there's little moments like this that really like like they involve you in a way that you don't expect to be involved in a very reflexive way like this idea of just like the, the natural instinct to try to reach out your hand to try to catch something that's being thrown at you it just you can't uh, you can't match that with a regular like mouse and keyboard or or a gamepad it's impossible yeah and someone called out astrobot on the chat too i couldn't agree more that, that mm, i haven't played that outstanding oh i need to play it then oh yeah really really good it's 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 the quality platformer of Mario, but using all this awesome VR, like being able to throw ninja stars and like the gratitude yeah. and pull a monkey, you know, stuff like that. Okay. I got to, which, check you know, I, I didn't know I wanted to do until <laughs> I played it. Sometimes you don't, that's the thing about these good games is you don't realize that you are missing something so important in your life until you experience it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, Richard Lico, honest to God, thank you very much for taking time out of your very busy day to come and hang out with us. It was an absolute pleasure as usual. And my um, pleasure too, Brent. And it's always good to see you, man. Like it's yeah, been it was, so long. It has been a long time. And I, uh, we have to make sure that that doesn't happen again. We'll have you back. I'm sure people will love to hear more from you. Um, we're, we're excited to hear about how the development of the new Moss game goes naturally. And I'm sure there's people that are going to be uh, very, very interested to hear any possible new developments down the road. I know you had sent out a message to your animation Sherpa community. It kind of a while ago, it was a few months ago going, look, just FYI, this i'm going to put put this on the back burner for a little while like courses are still available but you won't be able to put more courseware out there in, in the in in the very near future because you are obviously very busy yeah. with the, the with the new game but um you know obviously it'd be great uh, to see and hear when that actually ends up happening again down the road so don't be a stranger 
I'll have you back if you uh, if you would be willing to have, to be hooked back into the fold here, because uh, it's always nice to share space and uh, and vibes with you, my friend. Yeah, ditto, man. I appreciate it. Thanks for inviting me. This has been a, a great experience. Absolutely. Okay, J Richard, have a good day, and um, right. we'll, we'll see you around, dude. Cheers. Later, bud. Okay, well, there it is. Richard Lico in the flesh or in the digital flesh, the flesh as it were. Um, he um, honestly is one of the most generous and one of the most modest people I know. Um, I've, I've, I had the pleasure of meeting him in person years ago, as he kind of mentioned um, during the stream um, at an iAnimate um event and it was in Quebec city and I got to kind of know him a lot better. And we've, uh, we've kept, we've kept touch over the years and um, he's just awesome. Like the guy is just, he's, he is a visionary and he's exactly the kind of person that we need in the industry that pushes the envelope. He's the one, he's a, he's a disruptor. He's the type of person who's like, it can be done better. It can be done um, more efficiently. And, um, and uh, that's what we need. We need people that are willing to, 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 to push the envelope a little bit. Otherwise things get a little bit stale. Um, which I feel um, is unfortunately the case with a lot of VR games. Um, they just sort of, they just, they're just phoning it in. They're not really, you know, doing anything interesting at all. So definitely check out his game. Absolutely. I, it's, I cannot, I cannot recommend it enough. It's extremely impressive, this game, especially considering the fact it was done with 15 people. This is going to blow your mind. Um, and definitely check out his animation Sherpa site because uh, if you really, if, I mean, you all you got to do is you got, he's got videos out there on the internet. If you want to have you want to see an actual demonstration of him talking about his his workflow, um, I would um, you know go check out one of his videos maybe before jumping into the animation Sherpa if you feel like you need a little bit more convincing. But I I highly recommend you expose yourself to it because it's going to change the way you think. You may not adopt it verbatim, but it's what's going to happen is you're going to see animation differently. You're going to see it for what it really is in many ways. That's the thing I love about his workflow is it's like he boils it down into its simplistic forms as opposed to a series of things that you do like a workflow. His workflow is not really as much of a workflow. It's more of a philosophy. And you come up with the workflow as you're animating in an interesting way. So anyways, check out both those things. They're both they're linked in the chat, both of those things. And also check out, it sounds like this. he, he dropped a hot, hot tip for us. Um, with I'm going to go click on that link now before I lose it. Um, with regards to the, oh, I can't, Ugh. can someone, can someone like, uh, no, that's not going to work. Damn it. Can actually, so can I can rely on somebody to send me a direct message on discord with this link so I can go check on it. I can't do it right now because it, all it does when I click on the link is it highlights the text for you guys to see. So if someone could do me a favor and drop that for me, that'd be amazing. Okay, so enjoy the rest of your day. Enjoy the rest of your week, um, and uh, we'll see you. Uh, we'll see you next week with more Agora community content. Stay animated. Cheers. Good.